Our final speaker for the business seminar is Neville Kennard. You know, obviously with sponsoring Hopper's trip and convincing Hopper to come here for the first time. You know, we, uh, you know, if we could have picked anyone in the world, we did, and we got what we wanted. Um, when I first met Nev about a year and a half ago, he expressed, you know, all these radical Rothbardian ideas and told me his history. And I said, well, why haven't you written anything about it? And I expect him to say, because he you know, didn't want to offend people or some such comment. Because you meet many people and they'll pretend they're radical or in private they'll say something. But then, you know, even if they've already... Uh, Establish their business credentials or their career, they still, uh, for whatever reason, I can't work it out, aren't interested in, in, uh, in engaging with Rothbardian arguments. Um, but Nev just said he hasn't pu written anything on it because no one will publish him. <laughs> so I set up a website and uh, it's been 60 weeks and for 60 consecutive weeks he's written a column defending his right to collude, his right not to vote, um, and other radical things. Uh, I've tried to get people to respond to, uh, to Nev. We had a, uh, a federal politician respond, only to say that he will not respond. <laughs> so that was, the closest, that was the closest we have got. Um, and I guess one of our aims is from this event that, that uh, it's another avenue in which people will, uh, are invited to respond. And if they can't find anywhere to publish their, uh, their uh, attempts to grapple with Rothbardian ideas, they can send it to me and I'll publish it just as prominently as I publish Nev's items. Um, so please send in your criticisms or questions and, uh, and invite all your friends who are critical to do the same. You know, we will answer any questions. We want debate. And uh, without further ado, here's Nev Kennard. As Benjamin said, when I, we met, it was at a dinner uh, put on by Shaken and Stirred by Leone and Parnell. <clears throat> and the title of the talk I gave uh, was what I'm delivering tonight. I've, I've expand it and enhance it a little bit, I hope, my journey to anarchy, because it, perhaps it's interesting in how I went from being a political and ec economic agnostic uh, to become an anarcho-capitalist. Um, the word anarchist is, is not a very good word because it says more about what you're not than what you are. It's a bit like the word atheist, uh, and uh, but I, I don't, perhaps uh, Hans Hopper's uh, uh, Private law society is is a is is a better expression, um, but um, for want of a better word, anarcho-capitalist seems to be what we've got. Um, and I mean, anarch anarchist in its popular expression is bloodshed, fires in the streets, chaos, uh, and that's. That's the popular expression. When you when you when you look it up in the dictionary, it, it, fundamentally it means without a ruler. And um, I sort of see that uh, without a ruler, I see myself as being a, a, a peaceful, quiet, loving anarchist. I just don't want to have a ruler. That's all. Um, and the. Um, uh, what I've come to appreciate uh, is that the, the concept of self-ownership, uh, although I don't have it necessarily in all respects physically or financially because I get, um, I get invaded and, and uh, robbed, um, I think there's also a, a point in which you can be um, uh, ha have your self-ownership mentally, spiritually, and, and, and behold. And I think by the journey that I've had over the last uh, 30, 40 years, has brought, it's been a, I've been a slow learner, so it took me a long time to get there. Um, what happened in the 1960s, 
I, uh, and I found myself in business. I went into my father's business, I bought him out, and I thought, well, maybe I better learn something about economics. I hadn't been to university. I scraped through the leaving certificate with four Bs. So I went into a bookshop, and I saw a book on endemics. Down the spine was economics. <clears throat> I didn't know there were different sorts of economics. So I bought the book, hardcover, quite thick. I uh, took it home, I couldn't understand it. Um, and I, uh, I thought, gee, you've got to be smart to, be, to understand economics. It's terribly difficult. And uh, so I put it down. I didn't get very far into it. <coughs> I understand now why, because the book was written by Paul Samuelson. Um, then in 1970, uh, my uh, brother came back from America with a book by Harry Brown. Now, I, I think um, uh, uh, Ron Manners mentioned Harry Brown. He was a significant force in the libertarian movement at that time. This book was entitled <coughs> uh, How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation, uh, in which he correctly forecast I think it was a 17% devaluation of the American dollar around about 70 or 71. But mixed in with his economic uh, advice and predictions was a good dose of libertarian ideas. It just opened the door to me. I got another of his books, and in the back of that book was a bibliography. And I wrote away and got a, lot of, a heap of books. They were books by uh, Rothbard, Mises, um, Hazlitt, Nock, um, th they were the main ones that I, and, and I just got into the, and I, you know, reading Mises, it's not like a nursery rhyme. Um, but I understood it. it, it made sense. Samuelson made no sense. He had graphs and numbers and things, and whereas uh, Mises and Rothbard, you know, for a new liberty, why I was introduced to the anarcho-capitalist idea by Rothbard at that time. And as I mentioned, for those who are here on the, uh, the Workers' Party platform, I had no friends, I had no one to talk to, I had no one to share any ideas with, because if I opened my mouth with some of these thoughts, no one, they were either thought I was stupid, they were not interested. And the Workers' Party came along and there I had uh, a few fellow travellers. Um, and uh, as we mentioned then, it was the, uh, it mentioned yesterday, I mean, this was in the, in the mid-70s, 75 was the Whitlam era, which was, um, I mean, if you think uh, our present government is chaotic, uh, Whitlam was about as, as bad, uh, as bad as, as chaotic and unruly and as unpopular. So it was a very interesting, heady time in Australian politics and also in the economic situation. We were in a deep recession. Interest rates were high. Things were, were, were looking uh, pretty ordinary. Anyhow, the Workers' Party had this short, probably spectacular period, very short and, and very, uh, uh, I would say, a fairly inconspicuous failure politically, but it did coalesce the forces of the few libertarians that there were around at that time. So probably it was a, 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 a significant force while being a political failure. And then in 1976, I got a note from one Greg Lindsay, who I'd heard of because of his Workers' Party connection, looking for support for the creation of a, an institute or some sort of a, a body to propagate libertarian ideas. And I sent him a check. Uh, and it, uh, Greg was delighted. It was his first contribution, his first indication of support. So he kind of embraced me, and we became friends and colleagues uh, in the creation of the Centre for Independent Studies. In fact, after a few months, he was getting nowhere. He was a high school teacher. Uh, and trying to do, create this institution, the weekends and evenings. He said, I've got to, I need some time, I've got to have full time. So I said, well, I'll give you a job. We put him on the payroll because was, donations were not tax deductible to that, that, at that time. So to do it for the least expense, he became an employee of our company. <clears throat> Don't know what, 
job title was, but uh, he got paid and we got the deduction. Um, uh, and, you know, it was a very, a very good time because suddenly there were a few people coming out of the woodwork saying, uh, hey, here's a new body, here's a new group. And at that time, we were sort of the lunatic fringe. The ideas w were, were at that time quite radical uh, and it was quite fun being branded as uh, interesting but impractical or all sorts, but being somewhat rebellious, I suppose. And I think at that time, the CIS was quite libertarian, um, which made the whole thing quite, quite interesting and fun. Um, as the CIS became more successful, and I use that, um, uh, emphasize that word successful, um, it became less adventurous and it became more devoted to fundraising and it became more mainstream. And if I ever suggested something to Greg like, well, why don't we talk about drug law, uh, drug prohibition? No, no, no. Yeah. More important things, it was, he prioritised it, even though I thought the pro prohibition of drugs was not only fundamental to individual freedom, but also <coughs> counterproductive in the use of drugs and, the, and the, uh, um, the population of prisons and all that sort of thing. And of course the, um, um, uh, the contamination and corruption of the police. So anyway, um, I also had hoped, and, and, and having, I mean, I did read uh, Rothbard in, in, in about 1970 or 71, uh, but I thought if we have less government, which was the CIS position, or no government, it you know, doesn't matter that much as long as it goes in that direction. Uh, so I held out great hope that we would start seeing a diminution of government, and also, there were a few politicians starting to hang around. I thought, well, that's good. Uh, these blokes, you know, if they have some influence, uh, we might actually start making some improvements. We might see a reduction in the size of government. One of uh, those um, uh, politicians was uh, Bob Carr, who was then leader of the opposition in New South Wales. He became elected premier, and I thought, wow, Bob was, I mean, he was an intelligent guy, articulate. I thought, well, he's been around the CIS. He'll know a few things. He'll have some ideas. We'll see something happening here. Well, he got into office, became premier, became a politician, and um, he just, I don't know what happens, whether it's the, it's the lure of office, uh, the lure of the next election. It seemed that any um, uh, will to reform, if he ever had any, evaporated, and he became a, a big spending uh, politician. And he had a lucky run economically. Things were good. Um, and so that sort of alerted me to the fact that, well, just because there's politicians hanging around doesn't mean it's going to make any difference uh, if and when they get elected to office. Um, and the other thing that moderated the CIS, no radical ideas were, were voiced because the big end of town was on the board and they were invited to nice parties uh, make big donations and uh, we didn't want to rock the funding base. It was a sort of a congregation and uh, if you're a uh, the minister with, a, with a, an affluent congregation, you don't bring in a radical preacher who's going to suggest, um, you know, let me talk to you about atheism, you know. The, the contributions in the plate when it goes around would just dry up. So uh, there, you know, there was a strategic uh, method to this uh, moderatism, mo moderation that was going on. And uh, the CIS was just becoming wh what I saw as more and more part of the ruling class or the establishment. 
Um, there's also a, I mean, I had suggested you know, mid-90s or something, look, why, doesn't, why don't we in the CEO start a radical wing, a group of young, you know, you can have a, a Chinese war between, you can separate it, but have a ra some radicals, because I could see there were a few young people, but hardly any young people coming along, being enlisted, being enthusiastic, like we've got here, all this youthful enthusiasm. That was not happening. Uh, but I, th I thought, well, strategically, it could be, you know, the young Turks, the radical lunatics, could be just separated a bit from the mainstream fundraising activities, and it could work. Well, that that didn't happen. That was not not accepted. <clears throat> I also thought, had thought, that what we needed, perhaps, perhaps the big shift, perhaps the big change, would happen if we had a a financial crisis. We'd had some minor financial crises, but nothing very big. But if we had a major financial crisis, that might be the trigger for major reforms. Well, in 2007, 2008, we had that, that event. What happened? Exactly the reverse. Did government get reduced? Did taxes get reduced? No, it went totally the other way. Um, so, uh, um, I was going to say something here, actually, in, in connection with the, uh, the idea of, of new ideas. There's a, an expression, uh, management versus enterprise, uh, and also the entrepreneurs versus the institution. Successful institutions really don't welcome entrepreneurs. They know they're how, how to do things. This, of course, creates opportunities for entrepreneurs to start other businesses or institutions, but the institution is a force against enterprise or against institution. As the CIA has got more successful, the entrepreneurship or, or the innovative enterprise seem to go away. Entrepreneurs are disruptive, and institutions and, and management, sometimes it's, it's, it's labelled um, entrepreneurs versus management. They're opposing forces. So um, it was about this time that I was introduced to the, the work of, of Professor Hans Hermann Hoppe. Uh, it was a review of a book that he had written or he had edited and compi compiled called The Myth of National Defence. And uh, Professor Wolfgang Kasper, who uh, Hans knows, edited this book, did a review in the, C in the CIS magazine, and I thought, well, that's pretty good. So I went away and got the book. Um, and some, then I came to the Property and Freedom Society to, uh, and, and further works of, uh, of Hans. And I went, um, I went along to a conference, I think it was 2007, of the Property and Freedom Society in Bodrum. I invited myself, it's by invitation. You know, Hans doesn't want people he doesn't like there, so you have to be sort of invited. If, if you go along there with a, a, a bad attitude and a lot of money, he doesn't need you, thank you all the same. So anyhow, I invited myself, I dropped Wolfgang Kasper's name and he said, that's enough for me. And you know, some of the scales were dropping off my, some of the delusion that, that the think tanks and changing government, changing the size of government. I then had two experiences with the hope of changing government. One was the Workers' Party, a political thing. The other was the think tank trying to influence smaller government. Uh, so I'd sort of uh, pretty much given up on that uh, idea. Um, and the people at Property and Freedom, their work uh, were just stimulating. Whereas I'd been to Mont the Montpelieran Society and those um, classical liberals there, lovely people, do nice work in the area in which they, uh, they operate, but it's, 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 it's practically devoid of ethics and morality. Uh, it's, it's utilitarian. It's not that to talk about ethics. It, I mean, it's the word, this expression self-ownership, which I think, was that a Rothbardian expression? Yeah. 
you know, you don't hear that word that we are sovereign individuals, responsible, capable and responsible for ourselves. In the establishment think tanks, you don't hear that. So um, that was that was where I I, I came to know Hans. Um, I came to have a a pretty good appreciation for all the elements of a radical anarcho-capitalist attitude. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing is uh, practicing strategically uh, as much responsible civil disobedience as I can. Um, I wrote a, one, of, one of the essays on uh, economics.org, uh, uh, Civil Disobedience, the Rules of Engagement. And uh, the essential element, I mean, uh, there's two, way, two sort of sides to civil disobedience. One is just to do what you want to do without, with a minimum of confrontation. The other is to make a lot of noise. Uh, you know, wave banners and do things like that for the sake of getting arrested, for the sake of making your point. I don't want to, keep, want to do that. I just like to do a bit of civil disobedience if I think I can get away with it. Um, and the main thing that I determined was there should be no victims. So if you build a house or add onto your house without council permission, uh, if you employ someone for cash, you know, all these little things uh, is what I call responsible civil disobedience, uh, jaywalking. I wrote an essay on jaywalking. Firstly, it's expedient to cross, cross the street against the lights if you're not going to get hurt. And the other thing is not to disturb any drivers. Be a courteous jaywalker. <laughs> You know, smile. Because <laughs> um, people, you know, we're too compliant. We're too obedient. We do what we're told too much. That's, I'm not, you've got to be strategic because you don't want to go to jail for jaywalking um, uh, or smoking a joint or whatever it is that you want. You'd really, it's, you know, you've got to be strategic, careful. Uh, but I think we're terribly compliant. I, I've never had the opportunity to say it, but I'm waiting for the opportunity, is that when I want to do something, like put another room on the house or something like that, I just do it and I get a, a knock on the door from a council officer and he might say, um, you need a, a, a permission to do that. You need an approval. I, we went to the opportunity to say no, I can do it without the approval. You need the approval. You're the one who needs uh, to give me permission. I don't need it, thank you. I can do it without that. <laughs> Have it, I don't know what sort of reaction I'd get, but uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to say that. Now, one of the people that I've read um, is um, Henry David Thoreau. Many people here are familiar with Thoreau and his work. He, 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 he lived in, um, what, late 19th century uh, Massachusetts, I think, uh, and, uh, and he was a sort of a, he would have been called a hippie, I suppose, uh, then, but he, he didn't, he did his little work, he was a, he, was a nat he liked nature, and, um, but one, and he wrote, he was a, wrote one of his books, was called On Civil Disobedience, but his edict was, to be a good neighbour and a bad subject. And that's what I try to be. Thank you.